We are recording again. So sit down or we're going to get sardonic. So this third part of the whole process this evening involves various Worldcon bids. Uh, and we will have one, two, three, four, five, six Worldcon bids and then a couple of potential hi, this is who we are. Um, the first of the uh, Worldcon bids is for 2022 for the city of Chicago, hot dogs. Illinois, hot dogs. the city where you can have the hot dog but you cannot have ketchup on it without a note from your mommy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you're ready. So um, we're going to start off with some good news and bad news. Uh, we've been talking with the mayor's office in Chicago, and they got back to us this morning. And Mayor Lightfoot has committed that by 2022, all of the signs in Chicago will also be in English. Um, <laughs> uh, I, was, I, I feel that was a major accomplishment. Um, and I'm going to go with that as my good news before I come to the bad news. Um, so we are in, we, we, we just recently passed into Year eight of bidding, not the Hyatt. Um, and I'm here to inform you that we have completely failed. Um, we, we, had a meeting at, we had a meeting at WindyCon uh, for our annual meeting, and uh, we've reviewed it. And the answer is we're going to be at the Hyatt. Um, now, I know we've told horror stories, and you know there, there are some things that of great concern. But honestly, our experience last time at the Hyatt, the Hyatt tried to kill five specific people, of which two of them are sitting up here. Um, and having gone through, we feel the, the, that, that it's not a situation that will repeat, and we have a much better relationship with the Hyatt at this point than I've ever seen in my life. Um, so uh, up to and including, we asked for a little bit of a concession from them. Uh, you know, most of the most of our problems last time came down to some some uh, poor relationship between us and our CSM, uh, which is you know an important point for the convention. And so, rather than waiting to find out who our CSM was, we asked them to have it assigned early and let us meet with them before we made our decision about where we would be. Um, and we met our CSM, uh, who is a wonderful person, and who is very fanish. He came up in ska. He gets us. Um, and he, he was uh, excited as hell to have us and actually was tackling his bosses saying this group is mine before we said we want to know who's going who's gonna to take care of us. Um, so we're pretty confident he, about our he, relationship with the Hyatt. He used the word filk correctly in a sentence, completely unprompted. <coughs> yep. um, and so uh, we, now we've had at the, uh, at the top of the corporation, we've had a uh, slight bit of changeover. Um, uh, I know Kel Helen and I are co-chairing the bid, but uh, uh, we took over, we, uh, we had some votes, and uh, I have taken over as chairman of the board because my first uh, and happiest duty of that is to announce that uh, the Chicago 2022 uh, Worldcon bid has decided that the chairman for the event, should we win the vote, will be Helen Montgomery. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm going to definitely try to recruit Elaine, uh, so uh, thank you. Um, I guess, so right now, you know, this, this all occurred about two, three weeks ago, and then right after that was China and Thanksgiving, so I haven't exactly had a lot of time to uh, put much in place, but right now I'm starting to work on things like, you know, structure and recruiting and all of that. I have my magic book. If anybody is interested in working for me in any capacity, I welcome that. And you can come and you can put your name and contact info in my magic book and then we will follow up with you. I'm basically asking folks to really think about what you want to do because I think it's really important that whatever you're going to do, you're going to be excited about doing. Um, because that excitement is what's going to carry you through the rough parts. <laughs> uh, so I would much rather not pigeonhole you into something and say, well, you know, I know you always do facilities, so can you do facilities? When you might instead be coming to me and go, I have this amazing idea for an exhibit. You know, okay, cool. Uh, so I'm asking you to think about what you're interested in doing and letting me know, uh, and then we can kind of go from there. Um, 
The next steps are obviously prepping for New Zealand. Um, we have to file by the end of January. Uh, also beginning in January is when we're going to be starting our guest of honor process. Um, so choosing the guest of honor and, and we're going to get that rolling. Uh, and then heading into New Zealand and uh, if all goes well, um, our first appearance at a uh, as a seated world comp 30 seconds uh, will be at Columbus which we're super excited about because they're really close to Chicago <laughs> um, and that will work really well so that's kind of the upcoming plan and I think we can go to questions will you be offering alternative uh, alternate accommodation to the Hyatt do you have another hotel as well <laughs> Um, so our hotel contract with Hyatt is pretty large, and so we're start, as, as starting off, our contract is just with the Hyatt. We have hotels that we will grow to if the numbers support it, um, but but there won't there won't be anything official anyplace else unless we grow in size. Do the escalators in the Hyatt still try to eat people? Um, well, what we, we, we found out that the escalators had a double helping of people last year, and we don't expect them to be, ha to be hungry next year. <laughs> How will you make sure that the unions stay bribed? Um, th this, th this is actually one of our greatest success stories from ChiCon 7. Um, we have some fans in Chicago that we work with on our local conventions that are true blue union boys. Um, and they were on our convention as speaker to unions. And, and, and we actually had a large amount of money held in the Shikon budget in case we had a union problem. And we got all the way through, and there actually was a fist fight, in the, but it was one union fighting with another union because it wasn't clear on whose work it was supposed to be. Um, because pipe and drape is one thing, stage is a different thing. If you put pipe and drape on a stage, you get a fist fight. We, we didn't know that, but it wasn't our fault. We had a great relationship with unions. So we're planning to take the same approach of having speaker to unions and proactively speaking to them, and we've got a pretty good feeling about that because we had great success with it last time. You um, had some attempt at humor uh, at your last convention with fake program tracks. Uh, are you not going to do that again? <laughs> Ever? <laughs> I don't think we can commit to that. Um, probably not. <laughs> the, 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 fail, the failure mode of, of the fake program track, however, was, was a failure of, of technology and how it affected us. We, we totally screwed up the same thing at the Worldcon that we previously screwed up at a Capricorn. So you're going to try a different failure mode? we got to try a different failure mode. We have to try it again to fail differently. No. No. We it, like making new mistakes. Yeah. <laughs> what about the issues that fan parties had with hanging decor? I think, I assume that's decor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As opposed to the decorator, which would be a different person. <laughs> they, 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 they are still a little twitchy about what goes on the walls, but that's things that we're talking with them about. Um, we have, we are, we believe we're purchasing a little bit of leeway with them in that we're actually, the convention is actually pur purchasing corkage and forkage waivers for the, uh, for, for the parties and so we're effectively bribing them a little bit and trying to make the world better. The um, dealers had a bunch of problems with the Hyatt last time around about the cost of um, receiving parcels and other things through the Hyatt. Are you looking to get some resolution on that? Yeah, we, we, we're, looking to get, we're, we're looking to get a different system for getting stuff to, to the things and telling the dealers not to ship, but to ship to us and something that we can, we can then bring in. Um, because the, that, that piece of it and the fees therein haven't changed very much. Um, and, it's not, and it's not a fight that we can win with, with that. You know, it's just their standard business practice. It's a, not one that we like very much, but we'll get around it. How many attendees do you think your facility can support? Do you know your facilities? Okay. So we can go. We, we can go with about six thousand people at the Hyatt itself, um, and, and a few over, and a few overflow rooms in terms of how much function space. If we get bigger than that, we have three hotels that are all primed to 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 take on overflow rooms and add function space that are all part of the human habit trail of the system there that we used in Chicon two thousand. 
and we have the brand, well, not brand new, because it's now almost 20 years old, um, Sheraton across the river where we did our overflow last time. So between that and the function space that we get into, we could get all the way up to like 15,000 people. Um, that seems slightly optimistic, um, <laughs> but, we could, but, but we can handle up to about that size. With the, um, the height last time around, um, there were a bunch of issues with accessibility, particularly in some of the function space. Um, are you looking at reusing that function space? Has it improved? And if not, you know, are you looking to potentially move functions out of the, the Hyatt? So one of, one of the issues we had, there was one function room that had stairs going to it. That is no longer function space. It's now offices uh, for Hyatt staff. So all of the function space is accessible now. Um, there, you know, obviously they have not added elevators. <laughs> um, that would be challenging. But it is one of the things we've been talking to them most about uh, and saying that, you know, accessibility was by far one of the biggest issues that we had um, and talking with them about how we can make that work. How, but one of the things is if we grow, if we grow and move into other things, we're no, our, our, our our big choke points become less big choke points because we're going other places. Mm -hmm. um, but it increases travel. But it, people, yeah. So. It, if someone had asked, do you still have the grid? I don't understand that. You probably do. Yes, we still have the grid. Yeah, the Archo grid. Yeah. Oh, Archo grid. Well, it, in Chicago, it's Archo <coughs> grid. For for us, it mostly got used for signage. Uh, right. For right. Mm -hmm. we, be, but. It, it, we call it the art show grid in Chicago because we, we use it on our art shows. I know that lots of people look at it and they don't like it for art shows. That's fine. For Worldcon, we probably won't use it for that. It'll mostly be for signage. Parking, for instance, in Chicago has always been you know, not inexpensive. Um, are you looking to get a better deal out of the height or is that another one of those immovable height corporate policy problems? Um, it, it, the, the best deal that we're going to get out of the Hyatt is about 50% off of whatever their rate is at the time, which will still be an expensive rate. Um, the better answer is that uh, two blocks away under Millennium Park is a giant parking garage from the city that's, that, that has deals to be made for about $15 a day um, if, if we can get enough, uh, uh, enough, pu enough push to, to get the deal done. We have not started that talk yet. Um, but but that does mean parking your parking your car about two blocks off site. We we do have a great relationship this time around, um, more so more so than last time. But we have a fantastic relationship with our convention visitors bureau representative, who has been really really helpful and will continue to help with stuff like that. So you said that um, you you have a, a convention services manager who's wonderful to work with, um, and. Uh, question for you, how much of what you deal with with your convention services manager are you getting in writing to, just in case? Uh, unfortunately, the convention services manager and you is all relationship. There's very little that you can effectively put in writing and have it mean anything. Um, so, uh, you know, the, 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 the brass tacks of it is, you know, the, the, the general manager showed up to buy <coughs> us, you know, the, which is a level of the, of, which is a level of the hotel that we didn't even see the last time through. Mm -hmm. um, so, so they're excited and they know, and they know that we tried everything to walk away from them. Um, and so they, they worked pretty hard to get us back. And, and they were, um, w when, when we had our come to Jesus meeting with them about the, about the problems that we had the last time, that we didn't have to explain who we were working with. They, they knew. Um, the, the, we they, they flat out said um, to us, um, our, our sales rep said to us, this is not the first time I've had to have this conversation with a group uh, who was here before, worked with the CSM, and is now considering coming back, but very scared about it. Um, so they definitely were you know, brutally honest about that and very upfront. And it, it, honestly, I mean, I, I certainly felt better because I was like, oh, good, A, we weren't you know, completely hallucinating everything, um, and B, we weren't the only ones, right? It wasn't something about us. Um, so, your group particularly, um, this is this is your your you know, not your first rodeo with with a with a World Cup in Chicago. Mm -hmm. What what are you looking to do to to you know make this exciting and different? So I think right now that's the piece that I'm most excited about. We've we've kind of hit the point in bidding where I start to feel like oh, it's just bidding. 
and now we can start getting creative um, and coming up with ideas and, and seeing what we can do. I, we've got a great team, lots of people involved, um, so starting to solicit ideas for that. You know, I, I know last time we did first night at the Adler, which was fantastic. Uh, one of the things we've been thinking about um, and, and batting around is whether or not we could do an orchestral concert similar to what we did in London and Dublin, because that's not something that's been done over here before. Yeah. Um, that would be new for U.S. World Cons. Um, so, and, and because it's me, um, I'm looking to bring in a lot of theater. Chicago now has one of the only um, freestanding theaters devoted to science fiction and fantasy uh, theatrical productions. It's called Other World Theater. Um, and I am friends with the person who runs it. Um, so we're definitely looking to working closely and having them come in as well as other theatrical groups and musical groups because Chicago has a ton of them. Any other questions? No? Okay, I think you're done. Yay! Thank you. Can I, if I can just say tomorrow, I, we, are, we will be at, at the bid table session in the afternoon, so feel free to come up and chat at that point with any other questions or to volunteer. from Memphis for 2023 World Cup. Uh, Deb, do you want me to explain how we're doing the timing for yeah, this? Yeah, if you would. So um, at the uh, meeting this morning, the three bids for uh, the 81st World Con asked that we split the question time. So each group will have five minutes of question time immediately after their presentation, and then <coughs> all three as will be up as a group for a total of 15 minutes following that, the last of those three individual question times. So it's a little different than we usually do it, but we have a bunch of questions which are being asked of all of them, and this means that we don't repeat the question every single time and thereby eat up time repeating the question itself. So Mark, who is for Can't hear you. Sorry? I can't hear you. You can't hear me. No, I can't hear Andy. So Mark, whose questions are for your sheets? Oh, yes. If you, if you are sending up questions during the group time and it's for one of the three, make sure you mark who you want it addressed to. Uh, if it's for an individual question time, we presume it's going to the convention that's speaking. But during the group Q&A, if you want to direct it to two rather than all three, be sure to mark that on your question. Otherwise, the presumption is any question presented from the audience during the group question goes to all three bids. So have we complicated this enough for you? Good. <laughs> Are you Memphis? Yes. Yeah, Memphis. They snuck up on our husband. Okay. Boo. <laughs> hey. Uh, I'm Cliff Dunn. I'm Kate Zikarak. Hello, Smuffcon. <laughs> so we are bidding to bring the Worldcon to Memphis, Tennessee in 2023. Uh, they are in the process of rebuilding their convention center, literally as we speak. Uh, precisely to hold events of the size that we are expecting the Worldcon to be, which is somewhere on the order of five to 6,000 people. Um, we are their first contract. They're very excited. Um, and we're pretty excited. Memphis is a really cool town. There's a lot of stuff to do there. It's very easy to get there. The convention center, uh, if you're familiar with Memphis at all, is about a mile north of Beale Street, <coughs> which is where all the really fun stuff is. Um, there is a tram stop right outside the convention center. It's two tram stops down. Uh, Google informs you that this is a 14 minute ride. Yeah, that's always dubious, but they do offer tram passes. So we are, we are expecting that everyone should be able to get there and have a good time and fit in the convention center. And a lot of things are still under negotiation because we're two years out from the vote. Yes, and the tram stop is in front of the convention center, as in by the entrance, not in front of the convention center and around it. Um, so, <laughs> so it's about, we have uh, the new convention center is about 300,000 square feet. It is due to be finished in fall 2020, so we're not waiting and crossing our fingers that the facility will be available. We've got two and a half years of lead time on this. Uh, 118,000 of those square feet are open, I believe, columnless uh, exhibit slash uh, what have you space. So we can use that for both the exhibit hall, dealer's room, you name it. Uh, there is a 2100 seat theater included. 
there are forty six meeting rooms, many of which can be combined into larger spaces. Uh, there is an attached 600 room Sheraton, which we are currently in contract negotiations with. Um, and there are a thousand parking spaces under the convention center that we're going to try and get included in the contract. But the base rate for parking is $10 a day, and that's where we're starting from. So that's, that's pretty much what we've got firmed up right now. Yes, uh, Memphis is accessible by basically any mode of transit or, or transportation. You can drive there to the junction of several major interstates. Uh, I-40 runs through there. Uh, I believe it's I-65 that comes south through there. Um, you can fly there. Most international flights will require a connection because it is not a super hub like Chicago or New York. They do 20 claim, seconds. They do claim they're an international airport because they run two flights a day to Cancun. So and they're lucky enough to be coming from there. And you can take the train. From yes. London? <laughs> Ontario. Uh, so, <laughs> so what's, what's the local Mem Memphis fan community like and, and how involved are they in your bid? Uh, there is a local Memphis fan community. Uh, they run Mid-South Con every year. Um, we are in the process of reaching out to them to get them involved and we will be, as we do the circuit of conventions, as bids must do, um, we're planning on hitting hard, a little harder in the area of the Southern Conventions to get Southern fandom more heavily involved. Because that is one of the cool things about being down there, right? That we, for all that we have, you know, American World Cons fairly frequently, they're quite often, you know, in places that are further north. And it would be nice to, to you know, bring that section of fandom further back into the fold. So you, you haven't really, you're not working at this point with the local fandom? We are in the process of reaching out to them. Okay. Um, is, uh, is Memphis getting a rebate from their CVB? So there is a thing that is referred to as uh, Memphis Mad Money, I believe, that we, get, we do get a certain amount back in from the CVB on the basis of the number of hotel rooms, and we are looking to use that in particular to defray the cost of transit passes, since that should be relatively easy to uh, negotiate by comparison. We're not making any promises until we have something worked out. A week-long transit pass is only $16, which would cover the, uh, the both the streetcar line that runs in front of the convention center and the buses and so forth, if you so desire. Um, and we are also going to, depending on how much we're looking at coming in from that, see if we can't get the uh, tram service extended a little bit further into the evenings as is desirable. So given speaking personally, Memphis's weather in August, September is essentially my vision of hell. Um, <laughs> what, what are you looking for as, as, as you know, a real key driver for going to Memphis well, during hell? Well, the food is really good. Um, I promise that there is food there for people who don't eat barbecue. I really do promise. Um, the history of the city is really interesting. There's a lot of excellent museums. There's a really good zoo. Uh, if you're into getting to see alligators, there's alligators in the pyramid. They have multiple aquariums there. So the pyramid <coughs> is owned by the Bass Pro Shops, which are a fishing supply outfit. Um, and so they have built in there, there's like a cypress forest and a bunch of aquariums. There's a little hotel. Um, if you really wanted to sleep in the pyramid, it is actually the third closest hotel to the convention center, but it's remarkably expensive, so we're not targeting as a convention hotel. Um, and if you really never, ever, ever want to go outside, the Sheraton's connected by a sky bridge. So you could, in fact, just live in the hotel in the convention center and never have to step outside. Um, it will be, we admit, it will be roughly uh, 90 Fahrenheit, 30 Celsius during the day. And one uh, billion percent humidity. Yes. Uh, okay, I will point out, well. I live in Virginia. It will be lower humidity in Memphis than it will be where I'm, in Virginia, where I'm from. It is 70% average humidity in Memphis. It's like 95% average humidity in Charlottesville. So, as far as I'm concerned, it's going to be lovely and dry. <laughs> Festive. Um, it's amazing to me that you actually talked all about Memphis and never once said music. Well, we played Elvis music for people at our launch party in Dublin until people were sick of Elvis. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, among other things that you'll get to see, the Gibson Factory is there, there's Sun Records, there's an entire music-themed tour that you can um, do in an open-top 1955 Chevy. Um, 
you know, there's a bunch of blues clubs. There's, uh, in between the convention center and Beale Street, there is a surviving historic cash-only disco. Um, there is a bunch of street music down on Beale Street that you don't have to pay for. You will have to pay to go see the beer-drinking goats. But <laughs> yeah, apparently there are beer-drinking goats in at least one of the bars. Um, there's also a local curiosities museum for people that are into that. Um, it's called the Pink Palace, and they have like shrunken heads. It's some guy's Victorian cabinet of curiosities that they've managed to preserve, and you can go and see all the cool things that he thought were cool. 30 seconds. Um, Memphis has a history of violence against minorities. To what extent is it safe for uh, the members of the convention now? Many American cities have histories of violence against minorities. Uh, Memphis is no more or less dangerous than any other major American city at this point in time, to the best of our knowledge. Cool. And, and, and now a string of words that apparently are a sentence. Is the spirit of St. Louis still on the mud island? Time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll save that just in case. We could, we could we ask, ask that for all. Yeah, so, you know, Chengdu should be ready to answer that question. So, our, no, that's okay. Don't forget the clicker. Our, our next bid, uh, thank you, Memphis. Uh, our next bid is um, from Chengdu, China, also for 2023. And they will do the same presentation for three minutes, specific questions from Chengdu, for Chengdu you know, for five, and then we will move on to the third bidder. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Yilin Fan. I'm a committee candidate of Chengdu's Bid for World Cup of 2023. Um, since I'm new here, so a brief introduction of myself. I'm a science fiction writer, researcher, and uh, editor. As my family name indicates, I'm a true fan. Also, I attend a lot of conventions both at home and uh, in America. He has a list. And I also have experience in organizing local science fiction events. So um, two years ago, I suspended my PhD program in Youth Riverside and I went to Chengdu and work for a small fan-based publishing company as an editor. A lot of people ask me, why you did this? And my answer is, because I love Chengdu. It's an amazing city. So where is Chengdu? It's located in the southwest of China, and it's recommended as one of the top eight cities of China. The overall GDP of Chengdu a year is equivalent of that of Norway, the whole country. Is it, if it's yeah. not working, just wait. Now. Okay, the climate is quite good. You can see it's <coughs> neither too hot nor too cold, especially during the um, summer. Where we want to, when we hold to, want to hold the waterfall is August and September. It's not that crazily, crazily hot. Of course, it's a little bit humid. Mm -hmm. And the transportation is very convenient in Chengdu. The subway has English. Um, by taking subway, bus, and the Chinese Uber, you can get everywhere of the city. And it's really cheap. To cross the country, to cross the city, it only takes from six to ten dollars to cross the whole city. And Chengdu is the home of Panda, and it's a historical city of 2,000 years history. Um, it's a good mix of modern and tradition. And uh, what I want to mention is Chengdu is very inclusive and tolerant. It has a lot of ethnic minorities living here. So China in total have 56 minorities, and Chengdu has 54 living there. And also Chengdu has the largest LGBT community in China. They are quite active. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the food here is amazing. Yeah. Cool. Also, it's ranked the number one city of sand fishing in China. It has the largest fan base of China. And uh, this year, the growing number of sand institutions, organizations, mostly unlike ours, the small fan base publishing company. And it has experience. It hosts five um, international sci-fi conventions in the past 30 years. He has some photos showing how passionate our fans are. 30 seconds. <laughs> That's the ceremony and the oh, exhibition of the two weeks ago, the fifth commission. Okay, so right now we formed the Chengdu Science Fiction Association. It's a joint event, effect of local fans and the fans across the whole China to work on the bit of um, the WorldCon in 2023. He has uh, two options of the uh, 
uh, option of the venues. The first ones are closed in downtown. You can reach everywhere. Time. We have okay. to stop you. Okay, I'm almost done with all my PPTs. Like, that's the second one. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> It's dangerous to speak over time. So um, the visa situation for, for Chengdu, um, a lot, most, um, most of the Chinese destination airports usually have a, a 72 or 54 hour type um, visa free situation. Yeah. Obviously we're going to be there for longer. Um, what sort of assistance are you able to provide for visas um, and, and for, for ensuring that we can get them? Uh, so yeah, um, we will. In this part, we will work with government to um, have some special visa waiver or fast processing program to guarantee that um, everyone will get the visa in time. Um, and uh, also, we will try to have uh, try to deal with a low cost of the visa. Um, how will Chengdu? We we talked about the privacy protection issues for the European Union. How will Chengdu protect the private, private information of Worldcon members? Mm -hmm. uh, that would be on the government level, and we are aware of this concern mm -hmm. of the members, so we will definitely bring that up while we, uh, after we form the um, official uh, committee. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and what's important is uh, this, uh, this Worldcon a bidding is fully supported by the provincial and also by the city government. So we have a lot of um, um, uh, uh, initiative and also the uh, good collaboration uh, with the government agencies. So uh, hopefully we can uh, um, address that. Yeah, so we'll bring this issue to talk with government negotiators and, and try our best to accommodate the needs of most of our attendees. Yeah, I think this, uh, th this issue of privacy protection of information was mm -hmm. less about travel and more about the, the information that the convention holds about its members mm -hmm. and to what extent that is, I don't know why that, is that a definitely a government concern? Uh, I don't quite understand the government concern so about... The, so the European Union mandates mm -hmm. that um, private information about members be protected okay, um, yeah. and that it not be um, generally made available and not used for any purpose for which oh, no, no, it's no. it's other than that which it's provided. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. no. um, well, we hope no, and uh, since we're still, uh, it's all uh, <laughs> the bidding committee. we uh, uh, is consists of the fan-based uh, organizations, student uh, sci-fi uh, organizations. So we'll try our best to address this concern, definitely. Yes. So the Fanish community is, is pretty heavily dependent on things like Google Docs and Facebooks and, and, and other um, external services provided for, for cloud-based mm -hmm. um, storage mm -hmm. and information and access. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, will people be able to access those services from within Chengdu? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Um, like the convention two weeks ago, um, mostly most of our foreign conventions have no problem access Facebook or Gmail. Um, Google Doc may have a little bit problem, and we plan to have um, a special zone in the future for this convention uh, convention center. We'll make it a special internet zone that they have no restrictions for internet. So in the convention center, you'll have high speed internet access and without any barrier. And we uh, have um, informally brought up that up because that's a general question. And we even, um, I mean, from I propose to like building some portable VPN devices inside this panda so, yeah, <laughs> so whenever you go, you can access <coughs> your Google Docs or Facebook. Uh, as I well, I mean, I have, personally, I have a very uh, a cheap. It's like. Cheap and stable Two, VPN. It's about two dollars for a month VPN, so I can post on Facebook. Is no no, no problem at all. <coughs> Somebody, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Thirty seconds. Please tell us more about food availability for special diets and package labeling. Is stuff in English as well as in Chinese? Oh yeah, for food, this is the thing I want to 
I'm food. most happy with. <laughs> so we uh, have we do have a lot of vegetarian, vegan, and uh, halal restaurants because you know there are a lot of um, Muslims living in Chengdu, and uh, we also have kosher restaurant. I have chatted with um, the kosher communities, and they do provide the kosher food. Cool. Yeah. Time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And now we'll hear from Nice. I will come in for 2023. Yeah, I think that's all. <coughs> it's okay. There we go. Okay, so hello everyone, I'm Bastien Vavoli, I'm the beach chair of Nice 2023. So, uh, Nice is on the French Riviera, and as you may know, um, France is the first worldwide tourist destination. Next slide, yeah. So, Nice is close to Monaco, Menton, and Cannes, and, uh, and uh, the airport of Nice is the French second busiest uh, international airport, um, with a direct flight from over 100 cities worldwide. Okay, about accommodation, uh, Nice is a world-class tourist city uh, with a large selection of hotels with some 10,000 uh, 10, rooms, uh, with many restaurants featuring variety world uh, cuisine, and of course, the best one, the first one. <laughs> About convention center, uh, the total surface is 9,000 square meters plus three auditoriums. <coughs> uh, we plan to use 16 rooms with capacity ranging from uh, 13 to seven, 700, seven, uh, 750 people, 50 people. And if needed, uh, there is a, a second building available with. Okay. <laughs> oh, is that the wrong slide? No, it's okay, it's okay. So there's three auditoriums, uh, MS with the three, 300 seats, uh, Athena with seven and 750 seats, and our main auditorium, Apollo, with uh, 200, 2,500 seats. Yeah. And uh, of course, <coughs> all the convention center is accessible to people with reduced mobility. Last. Phenomenal events in France. There is a large community of fans and readers who support numerous festivals bringing <coughs> together SF fantasy, auto translators and ideals like Imaginal, uh, Inter uh, Intergalactics, Utopial and Comic Con. And this year, uh, Utopial reached uh, uh, 100,000 visitors, which is really cool. Oops. We are tied in your mouth, so sorry. Yeah. Um, in Nice, there is two main events, the Literary Nice Fiction and the uh, Pop Culture Players of Festival, and I'm the president of the Players of Festival, uh, which take place in the Convention Center, so we absolutely know how to run the, the sites. Uh, both organizations are involved in the French Beat, of course, and uh, uh, at the moment, the World Count in France team is led by a uh, group whose uh, leaders have been active in French France for several decades. Some are editors, writers, translators, many with past or current experience running local convention and festival. A quick thanks to our support. And to finish, just uh, we will please to welcome you tomorrow uh, to test our wonderful Pambania in the con suite around 10 a.m. And because I'm already jet lagged, uh, I wish you uh, to have a nice day. <laughs> So Nice is a fairly major tourist destination, particularly at that time of year. Um, while you've mentioned the number of hotel rooms in the area, how many of those do you have either tentative or, or, or actual contractual relationships with so that, so that you, you actually have them assigned to the World Cup? Uh, we have already pre-booked 1,000 uh, 1, uh, rooms. 
and we are waiting that we can book uh, two or three uh, thousand rooms a day. And the distance of those from your convention center? Oh, the, the, the city is, is small, it's a small city, so you can, you can walk uh, really easily from those uh, hotels and there is two tram lines uh, to, to reach uh, all, uh, all different hotels. So how many people do you anticipate would uh, be able to comfortably attend the Worldcon? Um, we hope to have a, a Worldcon site like um, Dublin. Um, so I think it's very possible in Europe. You were talking about 7,000, I think, yeah. as a maximum. In the facilities? The facility that you're talking about using, which is 9,000 square meters, you said? Yeah, uh, and uh, as I said, there is a, a second building if needed. So if uh, we we, sh we saw that there is a huge amount of people um, coming at the, the last time, we can use it and change our plan. The second facility is pretty large. It has hosted uh, the Davis Cup uh, tennis tournament. Wait, so we have to play tennis? If we <laughs> <laughs> or hockey, or I'm hockey. told. So, um, you're certainly the, the French Spanish community um, is, is, is fairly new to walk on. Um, how many um, French fans, um, as a rule, working on your, your bid um, have attended a walk on in the past um, or are planning to do so? Well, a fair number of fans were in Dublin. I wasn't there myself, but I, I've, of course I've been attending Worldcon since 1989. Uh, Boston, The Hague, uh, Winnipeg, uh, Baltimore. I was a member of the Chica Chicago, I think, in 1999, and then Toronto, 2003, and, uh, and uh, Montreal, and it seems to me there's one missing there somewhere. But uh, and for several of the French fans have been going to to several of the French fans in our team have gone to several role cons and we are going to try and recruit more. It's been there's been an upsurge in interest in part because of our of our bid and the way it's been we've been talking about it within the community in recent years. So fans have gone to Helsinki and have gone to Dublin and um, will we'll be going uh, to the fu uh, to future to the next role cons. How many small program rooms does the Acropolis have? What size are they? Does your main facility have your um, so so small rooms that could hold program like this? How many small rooms like this one could hold? Oh, like this program? one? Uh, or, or smaller? <coughs> uh, Around ten. Uh, then there is the biggest, uh, bigger sorry, bigger room also. So not a lot in your facility. Okay. Well, ten function rooms plus the three auditoriums, and um, so. Uh, that, that, that would be already... And then there are much smaller rooms, which I've seen that we... If the, <coughs> if the, if the, if the uh, registration justified it, I assume we could uh, also get some of the committee rooms and so on. One of the issues um, with a lot of European hotels is um, handicapped accessibility. Um, what's the wheelchair accessibility situation like for, um, for your at the current planned accommodation sites. Yes, that's it. Right. Um, in, in France, there, there, there is a, a law about accessibility. All hotels have to, to be accessible. So actually, we are a, a world-class tourist city and, and all hotels are accessible for people with... Uh, 30 seconds. What year of the hotels that you're looking at are air-conditioned? <laughs> Actually, all. <old. laughs> um, are you looking at um, providing any sort of um, family discounts um, or, or um, discounts for local fans? Um, we want to, but we are working on that. Time. Good. Thank you. <coughs> Don't leave. Don't leave. Don't, no, 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 no,
you don't, you, you're not done yet. Yes, so we now. Yep, and we'll call it the, the bidders from Chengdu and from Memphis back up as well. You may need to bring your own chairs, or, 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 or if you're prepared to stand. I won't start the timer until you ask me to. Or a firing squad. <laughs> so, a, a question for all of the bids. Um, from the point of view of your bid committee and your advisors, um, who are the members that you have who have Walcon experience working at, at, let's say, area head and above? I think this is going to be the easiest way to do this if the thing will actually reach. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, hi, I'm Kate, I'm at the Memphis Bid. Uh, I was the assistant area head for site selection at MidAmericon, and I was the deputy division head for WISFES at Helsinki, and you may have seen me doing an awful lot of running around because six weeks before the convention, my div head broke his ankle and couldn't walk anymore. Um, I have also worked on uh, regional conventions uh, at Baycon. I've been their guest liaison, and I was their roving troubleshooter for many, many years, even when I said, I don't even have a badge for this convention. I really just came by to say hello. Um, so I've, I've had quite a bit of experience working in generally areas where people are having problems. <laughs> um, but I have had experience at world cons, and our advisors are all relatively very experienced. Okay, yes. Okay, so in our team, we have uh, Terry Fong, who was in charge of uh, Treasury, basically, at uh, Montreal, at Montreal's Anticipation Worldcon. We have uh, Jani, who uh, now have a lot, has had a lot of experience and accumulates even more experience in a number of capacities, uh, including at in New Zealand and so on. Uh, Iowa. Perhaps another one thing that might be mentioned as well is that um, if it happens in France and or if it happens in China, it's going to be essentially the second time in modern the modern history of the world cons that it's going to be in a non-English speaking country with a major science fiction tradition, and that's also calls upon perhaps a, a special a special kind of experience. The only kind of re er, previous uh, precedent is, and recent precedent, well, apart from Japan, as I said, would be the Montreal Worldcon. And there I was in charge of French programming along with Christian Sauvé, as well as a number of things that involved uh, basically the, let us say, the harmonization of the Worldcon with a French speaking community. So that's also, I think, uh, it was not necessarily division head experience because I was in some ways outside the structure for complicated reasons, but I think it's relevant experience. Okay. Uh, for us, and that will be, uh, I think the Chinese team would be the least experienced in uh, participating in WorldCon. Uh, that being said, I have to tell the story from the other end. The general Chinese people and the fans get to know WorldCon since Mr. Liu Cixin, uh the three body problem won the Hugo Award, and we have like in the mass media, we have educated the general public. This Hugo is not French writer Hugo who wrote the Miserable War. <laughs> <laughs> so we have educated the general public, and uh, and now because we, we all know now, uh, Mr. Liu Liu Cixin is like is like the figure I mean, to represent modern China, the vision for future. And the, Chinese, the, the government from like several layers, different levels of government recognize the importance of WorldCon. That's why they send us here, even we are not quite prepared yet. And they, they want us to learn to observe. And uh, through these three days, we talk to people. We also invite guests who are heavily involved with WorldCon. We invite them to China, to Chengdu, to Beijing. Uh, we discuss with them what will be involved. So um, we are going to send volunteers 
to different columns to learn to work uh, together. So yeah, that will, uh, we will work out that part and to make sure uh, by the time, well, if we win, <laughs> by the time uh, 2023, we will have as many experienced uh, people uh, as possible. And what did I miss? <laughs> Um, also, we do not have experience in organizing running WorldCon, but we do have a lot of attendees and panelists, speakers on the WorldCon, like Regina Ken Yuan, Stanley Chen, Tony Amy also um, attended WorldCon and be panelists on it. So I think with all the all our efforts and all those volunteers sent to learn from the WorldCons, we will, we will make a good one, if we are lucky. I still want to emphasize the city government <coughs> regard World Cup as important as Olympic Games. So that's really, that's how the, that's why the... <laughs> They're not lying. <laughs> <laughs> well, Chengdu traditionally is a very like laid back, slow, like leisure city, very close to the country, like uh, uh, lifestyle, but now it's building like really fast, like high tech. So like we're going to stop you <laughs> because otherwise we'll okay. only get to ask one question. Okay, sixty <laughs> okay. percent of the world tablet. Yeah. Okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. So okay. stop. So so a question which is primarily for France and Chengdu, but given that I've heard southern accents could easily be asked for many places, is how much of your programming will be in your country's native language versus English? <laughs> So I understood the question to be how much of the programming will be in the country's native language. Um, one of the lessons learned from Montreal and is that perhaps uh, too high a percentage may not be of interest, uh, may not be relevant because many of the, in Montreal anyway, francophones who came, um, well, they already had French language programming in other contexts, so they went to the English language programming. So it'll have to be discussed in Montreal, there were, as I remember it, uh, three tracks of <laughs> French language programming. I think it'll have to be discussed on the committee. I'm thinking less. That's, that's my, that would be my argument as someone who, has, who had the experience of Montreal. Uh, I think we will learn from the Japan's experience. So we will have the uh, full English, com English panels and uh, Chinese-English bilingual panel and also Chinese panel with simultaneous translation as we did uh, two weeks ago in, the, uh, in Chengdu. So I think translation won't be a problem and language will be a problem. Yeah. Let's add it a little bit. Uh, two weeks ago I was attending a science fiction film festival in Nanjing and in, in, in our panels we have the simultaneous translation for both translating uh, between Korean, Japanese, English, and Chinese is simultaneously. The Nice is, as people may have noticed from the map, also very close to Italy and not very far from Spain and really it, a very kind of central position in Europe. So that it's really not only a question about French and English, but it also will be a question of a possibly multilingual convention and where I think the Lessons learned from Montreal, as I said, might incline us to look at more, indeed, a case of integrating uh, writers from across Europe who speak different languages and from beyond Europe, Africa, and Asia uh, within the programming with the help of either simultaneous translation or some of the more low tech uh, solutions that we have experience with, that is to say, human translators and uh, at the table and stuff like that. With all due respect to our friends from across the pond, I can pretty much guarantee that 99% of the programming in Memphis will be in the host language, host country's language and not in English. <laughs> we apologize in advance for the shortage of vowels. You just need a real healthy vowel movement. Um, what, are the what are the hotel rates that are expected during your convention? Oh, I'm holding the mic, so I'll start. We are currently in negotiations with the attached Sheraton. Uh, we are, we have bargained them down to 165 a night, and we're still sort of side-eyeing them with this, are, are you really sure you can't do better for us? Um, we are also um, going to talk to the Crown Plaza, which is next to the Sheraton, but not attached. 
Um, and we will probably then also have overflow hotels down on Beale Street that will be slightly more expensive probably just because they're in the historic district. Um, if we can't find any of those hotels, we'll only cut us a deal. We're definitely going to go looking for some more bargain options because I know that price points are sensitive for that kind of thing. Yes, and as we will be using multiple hotels, we do expect to have multiple hotels for different price points. I know that, for example, there is a Comfort Inn in the area. At the one end, on the other end, you have the Pyramid and you have the Peabody. Chengdu is the number one tourist destination of China, so for hotels you have plenty of options. I can say the good hotel of this kind of quality will only cost 60 or almost lower, $60 or lower, and the average hotel in Chengdu only costs 30 30 And also you can choose um, Airbnb if you want to communicate more with the local people there. Well, it means the average price. The average price is around sixty-two uh, one hundred euros. Yeah, and uh, I promise that it will be less expensive than in Dublin, but uh, for the rest, yeah. It's, uh, there are of course some um, budget options in in uh, Nice as well. Two two youth hostels, <laughs> and I've slept in I've slept in one several times, and right downtown, and the other one is on a, on a hill. Just uh, past the other hill with the Greek uh, ruins. How are you defining youth, though? <laughs> I mean, how old do you have to be to stay in a youth hostel? Four minutes. No, no, no limits uh, in uh, Nice, as far as I know. Four minutes is really young. Uh, a, a question that a, a question that Chengdu have, have to some extent already answered, but um, uh, probably still worth digging into is that um, these particularly for Chengdu and, and Nice, these are communities that are very new to, to Worldcon. Um, what are you planning to do for for outreach to basically, you know, effectively introduce and excite your local communities about Worldcon? Yeah, your local community. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we already uh, are in contact with uh, the, the whole uh, French convention, uh, national convention and the, the big convention, also the, the fan association in France. Uh, so actually it's uh, in work and it's going well, so we are not really um, say that. worried yeah, about that. Uh, Fortune do as I said before, because it's, it's recognized uh, as a Olympic like level uh, world event, so we will not only have a local uh, fans community, but all over like national based like sci-fi community will be heavily involved because well, it's the first time we uh, host a world Cup. and and also for Chengdu specifically, we have the most um, active uh, college um, sci-fi associations in I, I would say in the world, so that won't be a problem. The most active? Yes, yes. Okay. I mean, uh, there are like, uh, I would say, 20 or 30 percent of modern <coughs> Chinese sci-fi writers that are from like some the local college that grew up from, from the fans. So, um, will convention members who attend a convention in Chengdu be safe if they express critical views of Chinese government? I can see our guests are alive here, so um, so we are yeah totally um, this concern. I can totally understand this concern. What I want to say is that um, we are we are fans and we cannot decide for the government, and also we won't allow the government to decide for us. This is a fan-to-fan -fan convention, and we will do our best to make it accommodating to um, meet every, to make it accommodate to everybody's needs as much as possible, and make it very, very welcome to everyone. And on personal level, we welcome such kind of ideal exchange. Mm. Yeah. For one minute. Go. I think we get okay. one minute back. Yeah, we get a minute back. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much. So now we're going
going to call up some future bidders. Um, initially, Glasgow in 2024. It's time for swag. Anybody want to talk to Yeah. Dave. 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 These guys again. <laughs> Unaccustomed as I am. Um, Ready? You, you, uh, we'll, we'll just do it verbally, okay, because we've got 10 of these to go through. Okay, so following our official launch in Dublin, we're delighted to be here to talk about the bid for to take World Combat to Glasgow in 24. This is our logo and slogan that was designed by Sarah Felix, who unfortunately couldn't be here, and her art appears on the uh, website and in the publications. Next slide. These are our proposed dates, 8th to 12th August 2024. That's Thursday till Monday. And uh, they've agreed, and we've been agreed with the venue, the SEC. Next slide. The site is again the SEC, which this time the acronym means something different. It's the <laughs> Scottish Event Campus. Um, it's been used for the two previous World Cons in Glasgow in 95 and 2005, and has seen considerable growth since then. Uh, whenever we go back to Glasgow, they've built more stuff. Um, that includes the new Hydro, the, the flying saucer on the, uh, the right. Kevin Stanley, don't get too excited about the captain thing, but, uh, um, but has, uh, it's seating for 13,000, which is probably a bit big even for our most optimistic plans, but it has some small rooms and the biggest uh, advantage is it frees up all the SEC rooms because they can stick all the big separate concerts in there. Uh, the SEC has also upgraded access with uh, um, lighting, sound, etc. in the armadillo. And we have spoken to them about higher numbers based on Helsinki and Dublin. There is room to expand. Travel to and from the airport is also possible by bus, tram and taxi and Uber. Uh, next slide. Next slide. I'm working on it. There yeah. we go. Uh, in 95, we had one on-site hotel. In 2005, we had three. By 24, there will be eight with seven... <laughs> with 1,700 rooms on site covering a number of different budgets. Pr we can pull pretty much the whole convention and most people on site. And in addition, we've also got the student stuff and the, uh, the city stuff. Next slide. Um, of course, we're building on the legacy of the last two in 95 and 2005, and also the Crown Plaza is now the home of the regular satellite conventions in Glasgow. Um, in other news, it's also possible 2024 might be the first Scottish World Con. <laughs> <laughs> no comment. Next slide. <laughs> We've got a big bid team, locals, international fans, huge experience, five past Worldcon chair. Esther wanted to be here, but work pressure prevented it, and she wants to ensure she can get to the future Snofcons. And some of our bid team are here. Just wave if you're in the bid team. I think there's a, a few people around. Thank you. Next slide. Uh, we take pre support, spend rates, you can join online. Uh, we use the Stripe payment system. Next slide. We launched officially at Dublin at the party. 650 people came through the door until we ran out of whiskey. Um, we currently have 538 bid members of all types. We're hosting the breakfast tomorrow morning here. And the first on-site full team meeting of the bid team will be in the SEC next month with 30 or 40 already signed up. Next slide. Am I out of time? That's yeah, time. Okay, just flip to the last slide. Okay, we've got art, we've got a website. Okay, questions? So the problem with, with the armadillo last time around was the fact that most of the people spent their time trying to crawl through corridors that were crammed with fans. Um, has the, the facility done anything to improve that crowd flow? Um, that connection is still there, but what we've worked out since then, particularly with the Easter cons that have been held there, is we open the ground level so people can walk through um, from the ground level of the Crown Plaza into the, uh, the hotel and then go up either by stairs or elevator. Are there still personnel working at the SEC who were there in 2005 and know our needs and our, our particular yes, issues? Yes, there are people from 2005, there are people from 1995 uh, who remember us and in fact Mark Meenan and I were actually, we first visited there in 1987, so we in fact know the site better than they do. I'm not joking either. No, I know that's not atypical actually. 
So what are you anticipating as a as an attendance level given Dublin, Helsinki, and London? Um, well, as we said, when London, when Dublin started, it would be a, a Glasgow-sized Worldcon, and look what happened then. Um, the world has changed. I think we would say, you know, it won't be any less than the previous two Glasgow Worldcons. It will probably be bigger, whether that's five or six thousand. Actually, the facility can take, well, a Comic Con style now one of over 40,000 people. So, you know, if it's five or six or seven, it's no problem. Um, so, why are, you, why, do you, why are you going back to Glasgow? What other cities did you consider? Uh, we looked at London, uh, we looked at Manchester, Birmingham, <laughs> a bunch of other cities. The consensus of both the Scottish, English, and in fact most of the European fans we spoke to, plus the American fans that we spoke to, Glasgow just offered the best option. We have the most space we have the most re we have the most space usable. Uh, we we know about London, yes, biggest convention center, but mostly not particularly useful. Uh, you know, they've got a zillion giant exhibit halls, but not enough smaller rooms. The Glasgow option gives us a lot more smaller rooms. They have added a bunch of smaller rooms since the last uh, Glasgow Worldcon. So a bunch of things that used to require us to move things back and forth between the Connected Hotel and the SEC, we don't have to move back and forth between buildings because they've added a bunch more smaller rooms so we won't be using as much in the hotel. They, have, they all have ceilings as well. <laughs> What's the um, current sort of hotel rate range that you're seeing in Glasgow at the moment? Very much up in the air. Uh, for people here in particular, um, it is wildly variable because for those people who haven't been following it, boy has the pound been wiggling against the dollar. Uh, the pound has gotten, I won't say at parity, but remarkably close. The pound has been at 140. Uh, tell me what the exchange rate is going to be in 2024, and I'll give you a price. Yeah, somebody else uh, anticipates that you understand exactly how the Brexit situation is going to work and wants to know how the current Brexit situation and anticipated result, I suppose, some of the election, will affect your bid in the potential world kind. And if you know, don't tell anyone in this room. That's Just right, because we so have to become rich. <laughs> I think any attempt at that would be as f foolish as the person who asks. Uh, in, the, uh, in the in the British government context, yeah. I don't mean the people here. I mean, uh, uh, if you read the British papers, it's just all over the place. Nobody knows. We don't even know what the outcome of the uh, the election is going to be because of uh, you know, what do you call it? Uh, tactical voting. Yeah. Thirty so, seconds. Uh, yeah. Um, what do you think the room party situation will be like? Um, for Glasgow um, compared to how it was in 2005? Um, entirely different. We negotiated, for those people who remember the <laughs> last Worldcon, we had to put the parties into Hilton because basically they were the only people willing to give us a corkage waiver. Um, we reminded the connected hotel... Time. <laughs> This is now going to encourage you all to hunt them down and ask them some of these questions, too. So. Thank you, Parker. I just want to know if you're going to succumb to the inevitable and call the convention Interthingy 3. <laughs> and now we will hear from Seattle for 2025. I think we figured out chairs. Bodes well. 
Uh, so yes, we're the bid committee for Seattle in 2025. Uh, this is our bid uh, logo. I'd like to thank uh, Lee Moyer for designing that for us. It is, uh, I think, really, really cool. Uh, and also the, the little center part can be changed out to highlight other parts of our city. So this is just the one we're starting with first. Um, so yes, uh, Seattle 2025. The last time Worldcon was in Seattle was in 1961. Uh, things have changed. There's actually the monorail completed now since then, uh, among other things. Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, basically, we want to invite the Worldcon community uh, to our city to experience uh, Seattle and the Pacific Northwest uh, fan culture uh, and continue to build upon and engage with our community of uh, learners, readers, doers, makers, uh, and creators. And then we also want to give our local community that can't always travel to uh, the exciting places that Worldcon is. Uh, the opportunity to learn from and create with our Worldcon community here. And that's really the, uh, uh, the underlying um, animus behind, uh, behind our bid. Uh, the, the structure parts of this, um, we are uh, currently uh, arranging site visits with the convention center and a brand new hotel, uh, two blocks from the convention center, the Hyatt Regency. Hyatt's are apparently popular. Uh, for Worldcons, um, and we're working with Visit Seattle uh, to get that to get that set up. Uh, the uh, incorporation paperwork uh, for our hosting organization, the Seattle Genre Alliance uh, (SGA), because I like my Stargate references, um, I will be filed in the first quarter of 2020. Uh, but if anyone wants to take a look at it, uh, I can show it to you here, um, and uh, I'm going to. Sorry, I, I'm not dealing so well with the uh, altitude <laughs> here in Albuquerque. Seattle's at sea level. Uh, that's another yeah. fun fact. Um, and so I'm having a little bit of difficulty uh, talking and remembering what I had to say. Uh, the, weather, uh, the weather in Seattle uh, will make you all think that Seattleites lie to you constantly about the rain. Uh, so it should be uh, in about the 70s or so and very, very sunny. No, 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 that's August, not the rest of the year. <laughs> and I think with that, we'll, we'll see the rest of our seconds uh, to questions. Yeah, there's yeah. nobody up at this head table that lives at sea level. <laughs> and so we, we sympathize with you a great deal right now. That's time. So your facility, um, what sort of size can you take from a, from a uh, attendee point of view? Are you... Uh, and what's the maximum you could manage? So if we stick with uh, the, the Hyatt Regency alone, uh, it has two uh, ballrooms that are, um, I have this up in a second ago, 19,000 square feet, um, and two other ballrooms. Uh, it has 45 meeting rooms um, with oversized windows, It's and an executive boardroom. So it has plenty of programming spaces in that hotel alone for most of the events that we're going to be doing. We're looking um, at taking our large stage events and getting the historic theater that is across the street, the Paramount, and uh, using that space for that. We can and the Paramount has a capacity of uh, 2,800 people who can be in that space. Um, if we stay at the convention center, uh, the convention center hosts uh, PAX West every Labor Day weekend. Mm -hmm. It has... To, it, it hosts uh, an anime convention every Easter weekend, SakuraCon. Uh, it hosts, uh, uh, which, uh, and SakuraCon has about 6,000 members who attend regularly, PAX West, God knows how many. Um, ten. <laughs> and then uh, they also host Emerald City Comic Con, which is about in that 4,000 range, and Geek Girl Con uh, every November, the November time frame. Um, so uh, the, the space is really flexible uh, between the venues that we're looking at. What's your relationship with um, all of Seattle fandom? Uh, so as it says in the, the bid questionnaire, uh, so far the, the bid team uh, draws really heavily from uh, NorwestCon. Uh, that's the, the home, con uh, home convention for the four of us up here. 
Uh, we are also we also have people involved uh, in Fool's Cap and Conflict, uh, which are smaller conventions in the area, working with us. Uh, so I'd say we uh, uh, we're pretty connected with our local fan community. A lot of our uh, outreach at this particular moment is uh, expanding that. We just uh, tabled at Oricon uh, uh, over a Veterans Day weekend in November uh, to get down into Portland and start talking uh, talking to people there. Uh, got quite a list of people who are excited about the fact that potentially uh, Worldcon could be a three-hour drive away. Um, and the last time it was in Portland was in 1950, so, you know, come back. So... You mentioned your bid committee. Um, how many people on your bid committee at the moment have WorldCom level experience? Uh, so I was the operations division head for San Jose, the deputy division head for member and staff services in Dublin, um, and uh, so that is uh, is the direct experience with WorldCon. However, um, we're uh, sorry, and I just completely forgot that uh, Jim had experience in San Jose on the programming team as well. So. Um, and Dublin, uh, so and, and Don. Don and Don Glover is also on our bid. Sorry, <laughs> and Don Glover is also on our bid committee. Uh, weapons, so. <laughs> yes, and uh, and he was uh, really involved in uh, Reno. So we are planning on getting more experience as well. Yeah. How many of you will be involved in next next year's WesterCon? and have high-level positions? Uh, so because, uh, uh, at least for me, because I've been focusing on the bid and then uh, some of the, the Worldcon stuff, I will uh, be working uh, in the film fe for the film festival. I am working for the film festival in the film room. Uh, I know Kevin is also doing that. Uh, Jim is going to be on programming. Uh, so uh, we're, we are participating. We also plan to, to be hosting a bid table um, and, and potentially a party at the WesterCon as well, so. Any more questions from the audience? Because, frankly, at this point, 2025 is a long way off. It is. <laughs> but we did, we did put a lot of information uh, into, into the FAC, and I really encourage people to read it because it makes me feel less sad about the work I put in, uh, but it also contains a lot of information. 30 seconds. Right quickly, you have 30 seconds. My body knows that it's 1 o'clock in the morning. Anything else? No? Thank you very much. Thank you. Before we finish? Before, Before we, we finish. finish. We, we, we really sort of probably should make the token, is there any bid that wants to stick their hand up for a year after 2025? And the correct answer to that is no, but, but we will give you an opportunity to make yourself known. See, another country's heard from. Oh dear God. Felix Khan. I kind of knew this. I'm Scott Zerbeck, the current president of Alamo, and we are dibbling our toes and exploring bid options for 27 to 29. Okay. <laughs> you, you don't get to ask questions. And yes, Dave, what year are you bidding for? <laughs> I, I am not. Um, Helen wasn't paying enough attention to the documents we were signing, and she's now finding out that she's in charge of a bid for 2032. <laughs> Anything else? I, I'm hoping that's it. So thank you all for your attendance. You've been wonderful. Thank you. Before we leave, we have uh, one final announcement. Kevin Stanley. This is not an announcement having anything to do with Worldcons or bids, and therefore I suspect we can end the recording now. Lisi, 